Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I begin myself. My name is Afshin, and uh, I have a master's degree in civil engineering for almost 45 years. I have been part of a lot of projects in design and construction. And right now I'm here at your service. Now I turn to Mr. Hemati. Please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Hamid. I'm um, a structural engineer and uh, almost 20 years experience in um, residential and any type of uh, structures. And now uh, actually I'm working for my own as a consulting engineer. And uh, yeah, that's it. And Mr. Jamie, Jamie. Jamie. Sorry, Jamie. You, you are mute. Please, uh, please unmute yourself. I'm sorry. Um, hi, this is Cameron Salehi Shirazi, and I am a mechanical engineer, and I am an owner operator of a heating and cooling um, company. Okay, Cameron, do we have your uh, contact information on our file or? I if... think so, because I got the invitation. All to right, email. all right. You are in our email list. Great, yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, Mr. Kambiz, actually. In English, please, because we have Ross. Man, Kambiz, actually, Sam. فارغ التحصیل ورودی 46 هستم فارغ التحصیل از فوق لیسانس هستم از استخراج معادن تحصیل اضافی که کردم متخصص مواد منفجره هستم نفر 101 نفر 101 دنیا بودم از فارغ التحصیلان اطلس کوکو نیترو نوبل اطلس کوکو برگشتم به ایران و مشغول کار بودم و تا اینکه مسائلی پیش آمد آمدیم به کانادا از اون زمان هم شروع کردم به کار کردن اولین جابی که گرفتم بانسر بودم نمیدونستم بانسر یعنی چی یک ساعته فهمیدم و هم خیلی خراب بود بعد از اون دیگه دنبال کارهای دیگه بودم که الان در خدمت شما هست سپاس از شما اوکی مستر تاریک پلیز انتردیوس یورسف Hello everyone, uh, this is my first time here. Um, I am a friend of Mortiza Mutavali Zadeh, our senior engineer. Um, I, I went to school here in Shah's time and uh, over 40 years ago, I'm working for RV Anderson. I'm a municipal engineer and glad to be here. Uh, very welcome. Uh, Mr. Ahmed Awash Louis. Yeah. Hello everybody, I'm a civil engineer, I have a master in water resource management and uh, I'm working for mining uh, consulting engineer here. Nice to meet you everybody. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Apostatega. Hi, um, I'm a civil engineer as well. I have a master's in structural engineering and a PhD in construction management. And currently I work in real estate development and construction. Okay, thank you. Mr. Qasem please introduce yourself. Sure. So I'm Nader, I am working as a contractor here for a CD project, sewer pipes and store management projects with JD Canada. And I hold also master in mining engineering as well. So I'm passing to the next one. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rahimi, please introduce yourself. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ali Rahimi, I'm a structural engineer and uh, have around 25 years of experience in heavy industry and mostly in heavy industry, oil and gas. Recently, I 
have my own uh, business. I opened my own company. I'm, I'm working in different types of uh, projects, structure, commercial, residential. Thank you so much. And Mr. Ross, no. last but not least. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ross Ha. I'm a civil engineer, structural engineer, uh, structural engineering and construction engineering background. Unfortunately, I kind of uh, overworked, maybe <laughs> I got burned out. So I'm not uh, uh, working at the moment. And I sorry about uh, not being able to speak Farsi. I have a Korean background, so I can only speak Korean and English. And I always enjoy uh, watching uh, Mohandas program. So thank you. Thank you. We are glad to have you, and that's totally fine. So, Shaab just uh, joined us. Uh, the, the last one. Uh, Esther Yasser, do you have our voice? Okay. Okay, hi, Mr. Yasseri, if you have our voice, let's uh, introduce yourself and uh, we will start the meeting because everybody introduced themselves. I, uh, sorry for a little late. Yes, yeah, my name is Sharp Yasseri. I'm Murtaza's colleague in Joe Maple Joe Technics. Short and sweet, thank you so much. So hello everybody, uh, let's uh, start our meeting. Uh, today we have, um, I can say a special meeting uh, because it is in, in interdisciplinary, um, so we have two presenters and one uh, for um, municipal engineering back background and uh, Mr. Uh, Sean, yeah. And second presenter is uh, Mohandas uh, Morteza Atakani, he's a geotechnical engineer. And the topic today we want to talk about is um, the topic that um, we are facing in maybe daily uh, engineering experience. As well, um, these two presenters um, are very um, skillful in, in their job and what they say here is a kind of know-how uh, knowledge. So uh, I, we want to start with Mr. Sean Curry. Yeah. You will start. Okay, so the, Mr. Sean, please um, introduce um, yourself briefly and then we will have your presentation. Please welcome our presenters. Yes, uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Mohammed Mashouf. Uh, my professional name is Sean. Sean is enough. Uh, so uh, I'm a municipal engineer. I have civil engineering background from Iran. I graduated from uh, Ferdowsi Mashad University at 1989. After 10 years of working in design, construction, and so on, I immigrated to Canada in 2002. 2000, I'm sorry. And after a little bit of uh, study in Seneca College, I started uh, municipal engineering. And since the, I work in uh, two, uh, two places, uh, two place means consultant engineering firms. And at 2016, uh, at the end of 2015, uh, I started my own firm. Uh, basically, uh, we do site servicing, grading, some water management, so on, and my career is a water resource engineer, municipal engineering, uh, and more or less everything in this discipline. Uh, so, yes, I hope you guys can see my screen. Can, you can see, right? Yeah. The presentation here. Yeah. yeah, we can yeah. see it. Yes. Um, all right then. Uh, uh, here, uh, we try not to go to details. The intention of this presentation is to, um, to start thinking or get a very ge general knowledge about the, uh, about the foundation drainage system. And uh, the common problem, uh, most of buildings, especially residential building has it. And the audience of this presentation is uh, more or less everybody, 
everybody who has general education in uh, like in technical uh, uh, education, uh, builders, uh, construction managers, uh, even homeowners, uh, mechanical engineers, civil engineers, everybody more or less. They don't need, we don't go to detail because it might take, uh, it, it might be poor. Uh, so we have two presenter. I explain the entire, uh, the entire um, uh, I, uh, system process, what it is, how it's gonna be solved, who's gonna do that and so on, who's involved, the engineers. And uh, uh, Morteza can go and uh, uh, explain, present the uh, uh, hydrogeotechnical, how hydro, hydro geo, geological uh, part of that, which is uh, plays a major part of this work. So first question is, when this even comes to our mind or in our life, like, Simply, when you have a base, uh, wet basement, uh, you have a problem. You have to solve it. The quality of life, you don't need, you don't need a flood basement, flooded basement like this one. This, there is a funny picture here, but uh, basically is a tragic uh, basement because this water can be very polluted, very bad. So in, in another one is, uh, underground underground garage uh, full of water. This is happening. Believe me, in 20 years of uh, experience, I've seen many of that. <laughs> and uh, it's, I, I cannot say very common, but it's happening. It's happening even in big projects. So uh, we have basically here, we are, dis we are discussing only a residential basement flooding and uh, uh, underground garage flooding that's all so so where is what caused this problem the source of water is three groundwater traveling dispersing uh, some water through the ground and melting frost steps so i explain one by one uh, Many of that is very simple concept. The groundwater, when we have a building and this building has an underground structure, this underground structure can be a multiple underground garage or a, a foundation like a basement. When, they are, when this structure cross groundwater and then the building works as a, a basin, collects water. So, uh, so that's that. Since this water, this, uh, this uh, foundation wall, the foundation wall can be uh, concrete block or uh, put in place concrete. None of uh, these two guys are watertight. It can be water resistant, but they, they are not watertight. Especially when we have a built up uh, uh, hydrostatic pressure uh, behind that. That's, that uh, concrete cannot stop water. If we have water resistant material like tar, ceiling and stuff, those stuff, they has an uh, expiry date, like they have an age. Sometime in future, they'll die, they won't function. And then the foundation wall, concrete foundation wall cannot stop the ground, the, uh, the, the water especially when we have, there is, uh, there is uh, certain amount of hydrostatic pressure uh, over this foundation walls. So groundwater is one item. Uh, another one, whenever we have storm events, when we have a rain, uh, a big portion of this rain is gonna penetrate to the ground and it start to travel from the surface joining to the groundwater level. While it's traveling, if there is a foundation wall, the foundation wall is gonna, uh, is gonna catch uh, some big chunk of this water. So again, we, we might have problem. 
So uh, foundation wall, that's a one example of foundation wall. Water is can, what can uh, travel here and water can build up there. And the other item is melting frost steps. This is really a serious problem. In almost half of the year in Canada, uh, almost six, five, it depends uh, the weather, we have uh, under, uh, we have uh, minus temperature, minus zero temperature. Uh, and it caused the ground uh, get frozen. Uh, the, the standard like it's been accepted all over Ontario is four feet. Four feet is gonna get frozen. And this four feet in four feet of frozen water, actually, in sometimes in spring, early spring, and uh, it's, uh, it varies. It's not certain time, but it's early spring. It might be April, it might be March. When we have continuous uh, a week or two, uh, uh, weather of, of above above uh, zero, and then this one the, the 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 frost steps is going to be uh, melted, and then you can imagine a uh, huge amount of water can be released in the ground. Uh, to give an uh, imagine like the, the uh, a picture how much water we are talking about. So in uh, in Vancouver, which one of uh, one of the highest, uh, uh, it's very rainy, and and the quantity of uh, yearly uh, uh, raining is twenty five hundred, and the highest in Iran, in north of Iran, is one thousand millimeter. So in Vancouver is 2,500 millimeter. So we are releasing in only two, three days, two, three days over 1,000 millimeter water in the ground. It's huge water, especially when the, sometimes it's happening, when the, uh, when the uh, weather is extremely high in two, three days, uh, very hot, uh, it's happening, rarely happening, but it happened before. And then we have all this water only in uh, two, three days. Then problem can, can raise. So when we have flooding, then each of them or two of them or three of these phenomena happen at the same, same time. And then uh, it happened before when we have severe storm uh, and uh, melting frost depths and and uh, rising uh, groundwater, and then we have a problem. So, but the solution is not the problem can cause complication in our life, human life, and every uh, single of our, like it's everybody heard about that. Like if it's not, it didn't happen in our life. It might happen in a neighbor or, or relative. Uh, I divide solution uh, in two, two divisions. One, to single family houses, like small houses, any, any house, single family. And second, uh, in uh, multi-unit, uh, multi-unit uh, uh, multi uh, multi buildings, low rise, high rise, uh, and mid rise. In, uh, in, uh, based in the single family houses, problem can be easily addressed. It never rise if everyone does as they're supposed to. Usually civil engineers, uh, even surveyors can solve problem, it's simple. Everyone knows they put uh, automatically, like with all contractors, they put weeping tile. And this weeping tile convey water to a sump pit. And from sump pit, there is a sump pump. 
at some point it's gonna discharge water. By doing this, the level of the water, no matter what is the source of that, is gonna be dragged down to, uh, to the level of the weeping tile. Usually the weeping tile is here. This is the weeping tile. This is the sun pump, the sun pit, and this is some pump. And the level of water is going to be dragged down in this level. So then the foundation wall is going to be safe. The, law, uh, the, the line is going to, the line of the, the groundwater level line is going to be this way. It is when the system is working. Usually the sump, uh, the, the sump pits has a duplex. Like it has two, like a, there is an emergency pump right beside the main sump pump. So that's simple. The only uh, the only problem is you follow follow the standard. Usually it goes by standard. It's simple. And so where to discharge this water? Water is going to be discharged in. It might go to three resource to destination. One, you can discharge it in at your backyard if you have a base uh, solid area. Water is going to go down and uh, water is going to be delayed and is okay and is, is acceptable by most of the municipalities. If the groundwater level is not high, it, this is acceptable. And another one is you can, inside the property, you can, um, you can uh, propose an infiltration gallery. Uh, infiltration gallery is a channel uh, uh, is a channel underground filled with the stone wrapped with the uh, geotextile uh, geotextile and the purpose of this is uh, the infiltration gallery is discharged it holds water and disperse and release that to the ground gradually that's that's the that's the this and we are not going to detail how it's going to be designed and second which is very rare there is a public system. It's called FDC, Foundation Drainage Collection System, sewer. FDC is called. In certain areas, uh, municipalities, they force developers uh, doing that. It's uh, right now I'm doing some uh, project in Oshawa. They have in certain neighborhoods, they have FDC. In one, I had projects, they had it. And even in town of Ensifield, I had uh, subdivision, they had FDC. So, uh, clo uh, yeah, uh, so th that's, uh, that can be the case. So now let's move to, this is a ske schematic sketch of uh, infiltration gallery. This is infiltration gallery. That's uh, aquifer, the groundwater level. And this is, there is a perforated pipe inside the infiltration gallery. And water is gonna be discharged through a manhole or a basin. And it's gonna be by this uh, uh, perforated pipe, uh, it's gonna be distributed over this kind of underground channel. This is not a channel really, it's just a hole. Uh, it's a narrow width, it's long, uh, uh, the length is long and full of a stone. Uh, so, Water is going to be uh, discharged to this hole and percolate or disperse to the ground gradually and join to the. That's the. Uh, there are certain way of designing that which uh, we are not going to that uh, uh, because it's going to be boring and anyway it needs some uh, background. So. Uh, I think uh, my main emphasis here is on how we are addressing the groundwater problem on multiple unit buildings. Uh, yes, especially downtown Toronto, uh, since 2016, uh, the city uh, push everybody, uh, all developers or even homeowners uh, to to follow certain uh, certain rule, so uh, they they push everybody to enter an agreement, discharge agreement with the uh, with the with the city. So uh, the water. So who is doing that? 
uh, in all my projects I had, uh, we as a civil engineer, site servicing uh, uh, engineer, uh, we were doing that. There are certain reasons why we are managing the entire show, because uh, 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 because uh, eventually when we are taking water, we are discharging to the sanitary and store or a store, sanitary or a store, and we have to evaluate the uh, thing, evaluate uh, assess the capacity of the uh, sewers. One thing, and another thing. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's good enough reason. Anyway, we are doing that. So, but other engineers or architects are involved. So architect uh, who, who, is, who are working together on, uh, to address the city, uh, uh, the city um, requirement on uh, groundwater agreement. One, site servicing engineer, second architect, mechanical engineer, geotechnical engineer. I don't know if we call that geotechnical, hydrogeological engineer, maybe that's the best. So all of these guys, um, they work together to, in order to design the under slab drainage system, some pit, some pump, and discharges to this So um, there is an, uh, there is another way of doing that. If there is room on the on the on the on the in the property, and then again we can discharge it to infiltration gallery. The city push everybody does this way infiltration gallery. Since there is not much room when you are uh, building uh, building. Uh, 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 a building in downtown Toronto, usually everybody occupy the entire land, entire property. So there is no more room for infiltration gallery. And, uh, and if, even for design infiltration gallery, you know, you need even extra room. For example of that, you have to have five meters from every single building. So all, you need a lot of room to even design infiltration gallery and 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 some other uh, uh, some other uh, requirements to design this, so it's very rare infiltration gallery. I I never done it because I never had a particular. Like, uh, there is no room actually in none of my projects in downtown Toronto. So uh, another way is the only way mostly is uh, to discharge the sanitary and store. In sanitary and so on, uh, yeah, and then, okay, in next, uh, so what this civil uh, does, uh, the, civil, uh, uh, the civil engineer in this uh, requirement, they more or less manage the entire things, get, uh, get the hydrogen, uh, work with the architect to find out proper uh, spot for the, uh, for the accessory. Uh, for example, the accessory is monitoring ports. The accessory is the water meter. The, the, the water meter should be in certain spot. There, there are requirements for that. So we have to work with the architect. Uh, because we need to know, we need to room, uh, have a room in, say, P1, the first level of the underground garage. And then uh, the mechanical engineer uh, comes uh, play a role. So what they do, um, they, yeah, mechanical engineer, yeah, they design the under, under the slab uh, drainage uh, piping and some pit, settlement uh, pit, some pump, and so on, the mechanical part of them. So that's what they, again, they have to work with, uh, they have to work with the, the, the architect, the site servicing engineer, uh, even by, by hydrogeo, eventually hydrogeological engineers, uh, they, they prepare a, a report this hydrogeological report evaluate the uh, quantity and quality of the, uh, the groundwater 
and uh, and the site servicing do best on that. Uh, they're going to design the, the design the system to be to be discharged to the sanitary install. So I finished my part. Now I convey that to uh, to powerful hands of uh, Morteza. Morteza can go on with hydrogeological engineering. Thanks for uh, to be patient to hear my uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Sean. Uh, now I'm gonna uh, 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 present uh, some introduction in uh, hydrogeology because hydrogeology is a very uh, very vast part of the science and. We cannot go to the detail of every topics here in this uh, short presentation. So I will uh, only introduce the hydrogeology uh, to you and uh, uh, bring up some topics. So you can find these topics in all the, in the classical books of the um, geotechnical engineering. And based on that, you can uh, follow uh, the subjects and go through the details. Uh, <clears throat> if I can present my slides. Mm, yes, thank you very much. Okay. I think still you are pre uh, presenting, Sean. You have to stop it. Yes. Uh, how can I do that? Uh, uh, share screen. Maybe Hamid can do that. No, nothing is sharing. Why I cannot share? Okay, it's coming up. That's good. Hamid, are you going? You, you are. You are share that. Actually, you can share your co-host now. Let me, let me see. Okay. Anyway, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Now it's working. I had to disconnect, Sean, to let you go in. Okay. Thank you very much. You know what happened? Can no, you... I, I, I try to find my files, bring it up. Okay. Take your time. Okay, I'm good to go. Sure. Do you have my, my screen no. now? Yes. yes, we have it. Okay. So uh, let me introduce myself be before in, uh, starting the presentation. I'm Mortezar Dakani. I'm the uh, geotechnical engineer in Joe Maple Geotechnics Inc., who is involved in the uh, geotechnical investigation and hydrogeology and environmental studies. And also, I'm working for the sister company Enscan, who is GC and and involved in the uh, in the large civil projects. Uh, mostly in the uh, geostructures, the structures which is uh, interact with the soil. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the hydrology study and water discharge during and after the construction, as Sean mentioned before. Uh, hydrogeology is, uh, consists of two words. Hydro means water and geology is, means uh, study of the earth. The area of uh, geology who deals with the movement of the water and underground in the soil, in the earth crust, uh, we call it hydrogeology. Sometimes they call it hydrology, sometimes they call it hydrogeology, geohydrology, and they, they, they use these words 
interchangeably. But the, uh, the, the main uh, idea that we should think about uh, in this subject is that we deal with the water underground. We are not talking about the water on the surface, in the river, something that, which is not under the ground. The, the, the subject that we are ta talking about in hydrology is a aquifer which is under the ground. Uh, in an aquifer, you have a water table, which is the steady line that water stand for long term. Uh, and uh, during the season, maybe it changed a little bit, but generally in long term, water will be stay in this stable line and we call it water table. And uh, for the, uh, the water under the water table could be, uh, could be collected in two uh, type of the aquifer, uh, confined aquifer and unconfined aquifer. When it is in the confined aquifer, it means that there is a layer of unpermeable soil on top of the aquifer. So the aquifer is, uh, is under the unpermeable layer and cannot move to the uh, surface of the, uh, of the soil. Uh, if we uh, make a borehole, make a well in the unpermeable layer, and make the uh, uh, confined aquifer open, the water will come up. And based on the pressure that we have is on, on this uh, confined aquifer, maybe water will come out from the wall without any pumping and something like this. But mostly the aquifers are unconfined and they limited between the a layer of uh, unpermeable you know, soil, it may be bedrock or maybe not, and the water table. Uh, for the process of hydrogeology study, we need to uh, do some tasks. The first task is data gathering. Look like all the other studies, we need to, we need to gather all the uh, data that uh, we can find around the project from the other studies in the neighbors and so on. Uh, the other uh, uh, information that we have to gather before starting the hydrogeology study is the engineering of the project, the design of the project, the plan of the, uh, the project, uh, and also the, you know, the basement, the how many basement project have the, the deep the, the depth of excavation all the the, the specifications engineering specification that uh, we can find in the uh, in the design uh, the second task that we have to do after gathering the data is uh, predicting the borehole depth and locations uh, generally the location of the boreholes very depend to the layout of the project. So we should put the boreholes in somewhere in the ground that uh, can give us a good model of the, uh, the water when uh, it's going to move around the building. So it is important to put some boreholes in the sides of the plan and at least one borehole in the middle of the plan. And uh, generally we have the rule that uh, we should have one borehole in every 35 feet of the uh, project. So based on this rule and the general sense that we have about the movement of the water in the area and the, uh, the plan, the architectural plan uh, and also the elevations, uh, we will bring out a, a location plan for the boreholes. And uh, the depth of the boreholes, it depends to the water level, the, 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 the water table level, and also the thickness of the aquifer. 
one of these boreholes should be extended to the bedrock. So it is important that we have some estimation of the depth of the bedrock in the project area. After we, I will talk about this bedrock and the depth of this borehole uh, in next slide. Uh, after this uh, prediction, we are going, we, we should do the borehole drilling and um, uh, collect the samples in the, uh, in the um, uh, job site. Borehole drilling is usually done with the rigs, small, medium, and big size rigs uh, working for borehole drilling. Yeah, we use the uh, appropriate machine based on the depth and the material that we anticipated in the job site. And during the borehole drilling, we collect the samples. We collect two types of samples in this study. One of them is the geotechnical samples, the, sam the, the soil samples that uh, we usually collect with the hollow steam uh, uh, sample method and uh, uh, during the SPT, uh, the uh, uh, penetration test. And the other samples is the water sample that we should uh, collect to do the lab test uh, for the environmental part of the study on the water. Uh, usually boreholes in this study is two inches in diameter. It is a little bit more than geotechnical uh, borehole. Uh, uh, usually we do the geotechnical boreholes with one inches diameter. But for this purpose, because we are going to, to make these boreholes as a well and do the uh, pumping and slug test on it, we use the two inches uh, boreholes, uh, but uh, the drilling, the boreholes is, is, will be shared between the geotechnical study and hydrology study. Uh, we install the well in the boreholes. It means that we make 10 feet of the end of the borehole as a well. We put a screen, a steel screen inside the borehole in 10, the, the end of 10 feet end of the borehole, and we plug the other part of the borehole. So the water could, could seepage inside the borehole only from this part. So we have 10 feet of uh, borehole that can, can, that let uh, the water to come inside the borehole. Uh, after installation the well, we will do the slug test and pumping test that I will, uh, I will describe uh, in the uh, other slides. Uh, and uh, the samples will come to the, the laboratory for some tests. Two type of tests will done in, on the samples. For the soil, we do the grain size, we do the etterbergs, we do the, uh, the uh, moisture content and, uh, and hydrometer. For the water samples, we usually send it to the central labs for environmental analysis and they test the metal components in the water. So there is a table that shows the maximum metal that uh, could be in the water to discharge in, uh, in different uh, kind of uh, methods that Sean uh, uh, described before. And we should uh, mention in our report about the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the amount of these components and uh, the civil engineer will, will uh, you, and, and we, we give some recommendation how discharge these kinds of water with these environmental components uh, and when we, where we can discharge it. Uh, the water table should be measured for at least one month after the drilling. And it is better to continue three months after the well installation. Uh, to be sure that the water table is exact and we uh, consider all the seasonal 
uh, differentials in, in the water table. Uh, during the uh, measuring the water table, we define the thickness of uh, the, the exact thickness of aquifers and also the um, other specification that, that the, of aquifers that I will describe in the next uh, slides. Uh, this is a geological bedrock map that so we have these maps in the in the uh, in the GIS in Ontario. So with different colors, we can find which material is in the bedrock and how is it is depth. How is, is, is it is, uh, it, it's deep. So ben, based on the, uh, the depth of the bedrock, we can consider and predict how much we have to drill for that uh, borehole that I mentioned before, that should be extended to the bedrock. So uh, during the drilling, when we do the drilling, we find the exact bedrock. Uh, and if uh, the bedrock is very, very deep, we will leave the, uh, the borehole when we pass the aquifer thickness for uh, more than 30 feet. Uh, this uh, in in the in the well that we installed in, in the job site, we do two type of tests: rising head test and falling head test. This is the slog test. Uh, in the slog test, there is a slog, which is a, a cylinder. Usually, they made it by PVC, the hard PVC. And uh, it is uh, about uh, one and a half uh, liter to three liter in the volume. So we, uh, in, the, in the rising head, we usually uh, put this uh, slug in the borehole, let the water to be stable. So the water will be, uh, uh, higher than the level that usually uh, water table is. And when we let them to be stable, it is going down and uh, rest on the water table again. Then we suddenly take out the slug. So the water table is going down suddenly and start to come up. It is rising head test and we uh, measure the head of the water in the borehole in the uh, uh, very specific time. Uh, and uh, uh, we put this data to the software to, uh, to predict the, uh, the permeability uh, specification of the soil by uh, finding the uh, conductivity factor K. Uh, for falling head, it is completely vice versa. We uh, put the slug test suddenly inside the borehole, the water will rise up, then we let him go down and we measure the time when it is going down. So it is, it, it, they call it falling head test. Based on these data that we, we collected in the borehole, there is some, uh, some equations that we can find the permeability specification of the soil, uh, the conductivity factor K, uh, and the, the, the most uh, popular ones is horse slow slug test uh, formula and bower rice slug test. Both of these uh, formulas are linear formula between mm, Niper logarithm of the uh, of the calibrated uh, calibrated uh, samples, uh, calibrated uh, heads, and the the the, uh, the time. The other uh, uh, method that we use to predict to to calculate the permeability factor or conductivity factor is the nonlinear method. Most, most uh, famous ones are Hader 
et al, Butler, Butler and John, Press et al, and L.V. Zener. These are at, at, at some kinds of uh, graphs. We put each pay, uh, the calibrated head uh, and uh, based on the time on the graph and based on the numbers on the graph, the graph and interpolation, we find uh, we usually find the uh, the conductivity. I'm not going to to the detail. Uh, going to describe the detail of method. Uh, if somebody like, they can go to the uh, textbooks. There is a lots of information about how we calculate the uh, uh, the uh, conductivity from these graphs. Uh, there is some uh, softwares as well. The best one is uh, the famous one is aqua solve and uh, it is working based on the uh, linear method and also the nonlinear method the other type of the this is a sample of the calculation that we did in our company for one of the boreholes for falling head and rising head methods and uh, uh, based on this uh, information we calc uh, i mean the specification of aquifer, the permeability of the soil, we calculate the seepage water for two phases. During the construction, when we do the excavation and the excavation is open, so we, if the water is in the excavation area, we should do, do dewatering and take it out. The other, uh, 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 phase is that when the building is done, the water that collected in the weeping tile should be discharged. So we do two type of calculation. One, when the, the, the excavation is open and uh, the um, other one, when we, uh, we uh, 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 finish the building and uh, the water will collect around the foundation. Uh, for calculation of the discharge, there is also a finite element uh, method and softwares. This is a sample of that. It is a slide. And based on the soil uh, characters and also permeability factor, uh, I mean conductivity factor, and the, uh, the, the butter, battery limits of the excavation, uh, uh, the software will um, calculate the vector of the flow. And based on these vectors, we calculate the seepage water inside the excavation area or around the building. Uh, the result of the geological study will uh, come out in these tables, which shows the uh, uh, permeability or conductivity factor. Uh, the table in the right hand is based on the test, uh, uh, borehole test, slug tests. And the table in the left hand is based on the grain size and empirical met, uh, equation that we have in geotechnics. Then geotechnical engineers should look on all of this number and decide which is which was the best number for this type of soil as a uh, conductivity factor. Uh, discharge volume, as I mentioned, will be uh, calculated based on the uh, two phase during the excavation and uh, after construction for foundation drainage. Uh, these numbers will used by the civil engineers to, uh, to, to decide how to discharge this water, because the amount of this water is very important for us to, uh, to uh, decide which scenario is the better scenario for this project to go and discharge the water. Usually the water discharge uh, can be discharged in the uh, sewer and storm of the city by an agreement can be discharged in the backyard for the small uh, projects as Sean said 
or can be discharged in the infiltration galleries uh, and uh, let it uh, gradually go back to the water table. Uh, for the discharge in the CT facilities, uh, owners should make an agreement with the CT. Uh, CT usually have some restrictions uh, for this solution because the sewer system and stormwater system that they have has a capacity. So they, uh, the, 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 the volume of the water that we are going to discharge daily in this system should be less than some numbers that uh, differ, uh, that is different for uh, for uh, uh, every area, but CT will give these numbers to the uh, applicant. Okay, you can discharge the 20,000 gallon per day for this area. So the, our study shows that if we are in, the, in this uh, margin or we are not. Uh, the other factor that city is looking is the, the environmental factors and the uh, contaminate uh, uh, items in the in the water. So uh, the uh, uh, water samples that we uh, we tested in the laboratory shows the component in the water, and it should be less than a table that uh, every city have for their uh, facilities. Uh, as I said, discharging in the city and sewer system is the most likely one with the owners, but it is restricted usually with the city. Infil infiltration tank and gallery is the uh, solution after that. And sometimes when the water table is very high and we cannot use the infiltration tank, tank because, because of the high level of water, table, there is no enough room to, uh, to, uh, to absorb this water, then we should use the watertight method. Uh, in, it is a simple picture that shows that how the, the city uh, uh, underground system will catch the, the, the water from the project. This is a picture for the infiltration system. Tanks, the water is coming inside and going out. Uh, it, it is in, uh, I like to emphasize this, that hydrology study usually used for the high rises, townhouses and commercial projects. The, it is very rare that the uh, city asked the hydrology study for the housing and the small houses. But sometimes when you are in the uh, in this uh, riverside, in the top of a bank, uh, river bank, or you are in the conservation area and something like this, maybe they asked for the hydrological study for that type of uh, residential projects also. But usually they didn't ask hydrological study, uh, but sometimes the water level, level is too high and we cannot rely on the swamp pump. And in this uh, project, civil engineer decide to go with infiltration tank, or if the water level is too high, we should go with the watertight foundation. In the watertight uh, foundation, we go with a solution for the foundation that doesn't permit the water to uh, leak in the, in, the, in the building. It means that we waterproof all the uh, underground uh, structures. Uh, for this purpose, we should use the mat foundation instead of the uh, normal footing that we used. And we should uh, uh, consider some special uh, connection between the wall, foundation wall and footing. We need water stops all around these areas to be sure that the water doesn't leak inside the building. And also we use the waterproofing membrane beside the structure all around underside the footing and all be behind the walls. And also we use the, uh, this is a picture for the uh, geomembrane 
underside the footing and uh, behind the walls. And also we use the what inside waterproofing for negative pressure. pressure. Uh, we usually uh, recommended to use all of these metals together uh, simultaneously because we cannot rely only on one of them. Uh, we are going to build a, fun, a, a, a building with the underground uh, floor, which should be completely waterproof. So we should use all of these solutions together to be sure if one of them is leaked, the other one stopped the water. Thank you for your attention. If there is any question, I'm at your service. Thank you so much, uh, both of you. Very uh, informative presentations. So, uh, gentlemen, if you have any question, yeah, Mr. Afshari, please go ahead. Yeah, please unmute. Thank you very much for the talk, especially for both of you, actually. I have one question from uh, uh, Sean, and I have two questions from the gentleman, uh, Morteza. Could I ask all three together or just one by one? The first one I asked from, from Sean is, what do you think about the shoring? How we can uh, prevent the shoring? except uh, in, in, in the concept of uh, preventing the water, not, for example, installing some wall for the shoring, not, uh, not to happen this one, especially for the time that we dig, for example, the ground, and uh, we have to go for the parking. Sometimes it's about 20 feet. We have to go to dig it, and we have problem with the shoring. What should we do about that? So uh, what is the question? Shoring uh, is different story. The shoring is to uh, to hold the ground. And the, but the problem there is one, uh, uh, <clears throat> the groundwater, like it, there are certain type of drainage, the distance between the shoring, between the shoring and the foundation wall, they put a sort of membrane. This membrane has a, um, void between. Uh, the reason is because uh, water comes down. So there are certain type of pipes, it's called torpedo pipes, and collecting water, the distance, the gap between the shoring and the foundation wall. It, 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 there is a very, very little uh, gap there. And uh, but the, the function of the shoring is the holding the ground. When, when, there is a, when there is a neighbor uh, building, when there is a um, uh, road and utilities under the road and we are holding the, and, and shoring must be there, uh, Morteza can, uh, can explain more the function. Uh, yes, this has some, uh, uh, we have to consider it, because a small amount of water is coming, is being collected between the shoring and the foundation wall. And this water is gonna come down and it's gonna be collected and joined to the, uh, recall that the under slab drainage piping system. Some, we, in certain, uh, um, cert certain distance, we put this um, horizontal pipes is crossing the foundation and it's collecting the water between the foundation and uh, foundation wall and the shoring. This gap, there is a small gap and water is gonna go to the bottom of the foundation and it's being collected by, by these pipes, torpedo, we call that torpedo pipes. And these torpedo pipes are um, uh, perpendicular to, uh, usually it's uh, about two meters from each other, uh, six feet. And the oil is gonna be collected, uh, connected to this uh, understop drainage pipes. Uh, yeah, and uh, if uh, I hope I could 
answer your question. Uh, we cannot avoid, uh, we cannot avoid uh, shoring. Shoring is the, another problem because, because it's there, it must be there because of uh, uh, the depths of uh, excavation and the, the neighbor uh, building and the road and this and that. That's another story. But if it's there, we have to collect water between the foundation and the foundation wall and uh, showing. I hope I could answer your question or we can discuss over this. Can I ask another question or wait for uh, someone else? Let me let me let me uh, complete the answer of Sean for the shoring. Uh, when a project uh, should go deep in the excavation, we should support the soil from falling down. So the excavation wall should be supported, and we call it shoring. Uh, if uh, usually for the small housing systems, builders and owners doesn't like to pay for the geotechnical study. If we do the geotechnical study, sometimes for a small depth of the excavation, for less, for example, less than, um, it's about 10 feet, 12 feet, something like this, maybe the soil can be stand without shoring. But if you are going to do this without shoring, you need enough evidence for that. And this evidence will be collected in a geotechnical study. So somebody have to come before digging and do the boreholes, take the sample of the soils, study the situation, the, 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 the foundation of the neighbors, the the distance between the property line and the digging area. And based on all of these information, geotechnical engineer can decide how much deep you can go without shoring. But if you don't have this, the city asks you for any more than four feet excavation, you should do the uh, uh, shoring. And if you want to avoid of this, you should excavate on the angle, angle of uh, repose, and uh, it is 10 to seven based on the building code. So if you have enough area, you can dig on the angle. And if you don't want to do that, you should do the soil study and in, uh, geotechnical engineer should stamp a letter for the city that I believe that I, uh, I certify that this soil in this area will uh, stay um, uh, for digging this amount of the depth for 10 feet, eight feet, something like this. But usually for the small buildings, the builders and owners doesn't like it because they have to spend uh, six, seven, eight thousand dollars before start the job for this study and usually they don't like it. But sometimes it helps them to avoid of $100,000 of shoring. And uh, it is difficult to convince the owner about this payment for this geotechnical study. But the problem that we have with the water in the shoring is different. When the water table is up, there is, there is a high water level and you should excavate under the water level, you need to dewatering the area before excavating. And it is completely different story. You, the engineer should design a dewatering system to dewater the excavating area. And the uh, part of the presentation that I show that we calculate the water discharge during the excavation, it depends to this part, the dewatering during the excavation. Thank you very much. The problem that we have is uh, right now is uh, because of the street, uh, 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 the street angle is about uh, four degrees and uh, there is no way to prevent the water because always from the top, the water, especially during the last uh, 
uh, two months, we had a lot of snow and, the, and the rain. So it was falling down and we had to uh, prevent that one by uh, using the post and everything to, uh, to uh, um, stop the, the wall uh, from the point of the, uh, the falling down. But is, another is, question is ministry, I, is ministry of Labor involved in this? No, just the town is coming over here. Okay. Okay, so uh, if you like, you can connect me on my uh, email or on my my phone number. Then we can talk about the 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 your your specific project more in more detail. For sure. Thank you very much. Right. I leave right now. I I, I wait for uh, my uh, next question, but later. Um, okay, R Russ, uh, you can shoot your question. Thank you. I have uh, two very simple uh, questions, very basic. Uh, one is, Sean, uh, you mentioned the four foot frost depth uh, basically applies throughout Ontario. I'm just wondering what is the reason behind that? Because uh, places like Toronto, the weather condition here in Toronto versus uh, Thunder Bay or Timmins up north is quite different and still four foot uh, frost depth is applied to foundation footing design, basically. I'd like to know the reasoning for that. And second one is, I believe uh, this one also applies to Sean and maybe both speakers. That is that in Toronto and Southern Ontario, do we have separate uh, stormwater system and uh, sanitary sewage system? I mean, two different types of uh, pipes. Are they combined? Are they mixed? Or What's the situation? I'm from uh, Alberta a long, long time ago, and we do have separate sewage drainage system. Do we have that mostly here in Toronto or in Southern Ontario? Thank you. Uh, let me go with the first question and Sean going with the second one. The frost depth is four feet based on the building code. And the building code is issued for all, G, uh, uh, all Ontario area. But if you like to know what is the exact frost zone in the project location, you can do the geotechnical study. And based on the soil uh, grain, uh, sizes and grain, uh, grain analysis of the soil and the moisture of the soil and the other parameters of the soil, the geotechnical engineer, engineer can predict the exact depth of the frost. So if you don't have this study, you should follow four feet. It doesn't matter you are in the north or south. It is, it is for all of the Ontario. Maybe it is too much for some part of the Ontario, but if you don't have any stat geotechnical study, you, do, you should follow that one. If you have this study, you can follow your study because you have some evidence about it. Okay, Sean, you can go with the second. Yes, I'll jump in. So uh, based on the, uh, every municipality, they have their own, standard, uh, this is mandatory. And uh, based on the standard, uh, we must have at least two sanitary, independent sanitary sewer system and, and the storm system. In some municipalities, for some specific reason, they have FCD, uh, uh, so Foundation Drainage Collection System. If foundation drainage, if DC, if DC, <laughs> so, uh, uh, but that's not common. Uh, that's rare. But basically, it's supposed to be only sanitary and storm. And there is a reason behind that uh, because uh, a storm it ha it's a is a sudden flow, and it depends the time. And uh, when we have a storm, especially like severe storm in very short time, say uh, basically 10 minutes, it goes to the maximum and then goes, comes down uh, again. So, and, uh, and so on, but sanitary, it has a steady, steady flow. And only during the day, it fluctuates uh, a little bit up and down. 
So this two and storm is a clean water. Sanitary, it should be treated. So if they mix them together, and then it's gonna be a lot of trouble. Uh, uh, this mix, the mix, uh, it's called combined sewer system. Combined sewer system is not ideal, but it is there. Uh, old cities with history of uh, urbanizing, like city of Toronto, they have that un unfortunate, uh, unfortunate destiny. So we have a lot of uh, a, a huge network of combined sewer in downtown Toronto. And uh, the city of Toronto spent a lot of, a lot of money and to, uh, to fix that up but it never goes away until uh, they really separate uh, these two systems. And um, so uh, it still is there. Yes, we have combined sewer in, in old cities, um, but that's bad because when there is a rain, when there is a especially severe storm uh, events, uh, like 100 year storm, and then if they are combined and then, uh, a huge amount of water, stone water, is going to be rushed to the uh, treatment, uh, sanitary treatment plants, which it doesn't have capacity for that water, and it, 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 like it, it causes dysfunction. Like the, the system will be dis dysfunctional, and it's going to be rushed to the lake. That this problem alone caused a lot of problems. So they try to uh, solve that. And one solution for that, they install a lot of splitter. It's called splitters. Uh, splitter is a kind of um, uh, kind of device when the flow rate reach in certain level, uh, divert the flow, uh, divert the flow to a uh, certain way, uh, not to the treatment chamber, treatment uh, uh, facilities. It goes to the lake in, in different way. But it's still with all of this effort, it's still the problem is there. So for that reason, we have a, a basement flooding area. And it's been a lot of uh, continuous, it still is there like a study on uh, basement flooding areas in downtown Toronto. And whenever we have a project in those areas, we have to run a waste uh, sanitary study and to show the city uh, which this specific development uh, doesn't cause problem, doesn't add the problem or if, it caused problem, what is the uh, particip what, uh, how much is participating to the problem? And they, uh, they pay some money, uh, cash in lieu to the city to solve the problem. So bottom line is this, there is a combined sewer system, it's causing a lot of problem to uh, the area and the city over decades tried to collect water uh, from the new developments to uh, co collect money, I'm sorry, collect uh, money from the new new de development when it reached a certain amount. And then they uh, define new projects to separate sewer and sanitary and decommission the combined sewer. But still, uh, we are uh, still, we, are, we have a long way to solve the problem in downtown Toronto. But in new cities like, like Richmond Hill, Markham, uh, one, they never have problem because uh, everything is brand new. And so they don't have, I hope I could answer your question. Thank you. Uh, if I may, I want to add a sentence uh, about the depth of the uh, frost action. Uh, the building code is a little bit ambiguous about this matter. And uh, the four feet that is prescribed in part nine of building code uh, is really the minimum. We have certain uh, other uh, resources to find out about the uh, estimated frost action depth of different parts of Ontario. For example, the, the chart that I have is prepared by the Ministry of Transportation and there are other uh, charts prepared by 
other institutions. So the bottom line is that uh, don't go uh, based on four feet for every place. Four feet depth of frost action is actually the minimum around GTA, but when you go up north, north of Berry, there are places that it is more than that. Just wanted to mention that. But uh, in every one of those uh, publications, there's a footnote that says for a specific sites, you have to do a specific study and find out for yourself. But there are recommendations with more than four feet of depth of uh, frost action. Yeah, in the city of Ottawa, for example, they required five foot uh, frost protection. But maybe in North Thunder Bay or I don't know, North Bay, even maybe more. Um, okay, uh, so um, thank. is there any other, uh, any question? Yeah, Mr. Uh, let's uh, Mr. Jamali Fair and then Mr. Afshari. All right, uh, just I have a small question. Can I? Do, uh, am I the first? Sure, sure, please go ahead. Uh, you know, I have uh, uh, just a small question about the corrosion. Uh, I don't know, you talked about the resistivity of the soil, and after that, I don't know. Uh, did this affect on the concrete or the all the metals you use in the soil or not? Thank you. What is that from going Yes, the corrosion is the other item that when we uh, interact with the water in the soil, we should consider. And uh, usually in, in the, in the, in the uh, buildings that inside the water, they ask the engineer to, uh, to sign a letter about the corrosion and the lifetime of, of, the, of the project. And uh, we need to do the uh, special uh, uh, soil analysis and water analysis to find the ingredients that can uh, can affect uh, uh, can 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 make a corrosion on the on the concrete and also can be uh, danger for the rebars or seeds and so on. And then based on the design of the foundation and footing, uh, we should consider that one. Uh, and with the cover of the um, concrete, uh, we, should, uh, we should consider, with, I, I mean the thickness of the wall and the, the thickness of the footings, we should uh, consider this corrosion in the design and say, okay, it is, it's okay for 100 years. Usually they ask for 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, it is, it is a part of this study that when we are in track with the water uh, directly with the basement, we should consider it. Yeah. Uh, just I want to, wanted to know uh, exactly uh, where the condition is severe. You know, if you have some severe condition in the soil, uh, I don't know, we have to, for example, change all the, for example, uh, soil is not possible, or we can treat the soil with some extra uh, additional things you, are, you can no, use. We can, with the no, we can, the we can use the coating for the, 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 uh, the, the, the foundation, foundation wall. Yeah. Oh, I see. We can, we can do the coating, the special coating to prevent the corrosion if there is a very severe situation. Yeah. Oh, but yes. usually it is not so severe. It is that safe. Thank you. Are you talking about cont contamination? It's uh, some reaction of the sulfate on the on the concrete and also oh, sulfate? Yeah, alkali reactions that maybe we have with some kind of the aggregates and uh, some nitrates uh, have some actions on the concrete. So we should consider all of these. We should uh, calculate the erosion depth of the concrete. S usually we can use the enough cover for that and, uh, uh, and consider a thickness for the erosion, especially for the steels. And uh, for the concrete, usually we use the, some special paints to 
coating the, the, the concrete if there is a, a contaminated situation and the erosion risk. Yeah, around GTA, around the Great Lakes, uh, normally we are uh, dealing with uh, fresh water. Even, uh, even underground, uh, the situation of water is not that bad. Yeah. But uh, in harbors, in areas uh, near seawater, there's always that kind of issues. And there are very, uh, very classical uh, measures that we can make. One of them is to uh, insulate properly. One of them is to make active anti-corrosion systems that uh, charge certain amount of uh, electricity into the system and reverse the uh, process of corrosion. But uh, I guess that whole uh, issue is outside the scope of presentation of today's talks. Yeah. Yeah, but usually sometimes the conservation authorities, when we are in the wet uh, land zone, they ask owners for this uh, study, the corrosion of the foundation. Uh, in, in Toronto, I didn't find any kind of uh, danger material in the soil or in the water for the concrete, but maybe in some parts in the harbor area, maybe we can find. Okay, uh, Mr. Afshay, you can go. Thank you very much. 1991, uh, because of the price of the gold has gone, uh, have been, uh, has been uh, increased to, uh, to the level that all the uh, canceled and stopped mining uh, wells. Uh, so uh, they started to uh, dig uh, more and going to the to underground. There was a well with a depth of 400 feet and uh, a square feet of the, di the diameter was about uh, 18 by the 14. And that was 400 uh, meter actually, 400 meter, 400 feet. And we had to dig it more to get to 1200 feet. I was the shaft captain and the problem that they had was the water at the bottom of the 400 feet, like it rained a storm rain was coming down because hitting the, the rocks and the walls and we couldn't see each other more than 40 centimeters distance of, uh, of, uh, of each other actually. I started to follow the, <clears throat> to know that what was the problem that this happened to us and why it doesn't prevent it before then I found that because it was about 40 years ago that the well was dead, was dug. So was there any solution to freeze that water on the top not to get down? I made a water catcher actually. And for that one, I received the 1992, I received fifteen thousand dollars price, and in that time I was the the actually the professional engineer, and I had uh, I was able to be the boss and the master, or for example the shaft captain. But uh, still we had problem. Till 1,200 feet, uh, still we had problem. The water was coming, and we couldn't see each other. Was there any? solution for that to freeze it or to just uh, do something? Uh, yes, there is some solutions. Uh, Shahab is here. He's, he's very good in tunneling in the underground, uh, a big excavation underground. I think Shahab can, uh, can give you some solutions on this. But yes, we can do the freezing from the top with some, uh, some small boreholes is going down and put the, the, the some thrown gases inside the soil and, and freeze it. One of the methods that we do the tunneling, but when we are encounter the water is the freezing and, and, and digging. So yes, there is the classical method for freezing from the top, 
but it is not the uh, the um, subject of this presentation. If you like, I can introduce you some books about this that they have. There is a good book, Deep Excavation. It is a very old one, but there is lots of phrasing methods in this book that you can find. Okay. Uh, if I can add some points uh, for the underground, like tunnels or mining, we usually have two methods of the uh, water treatment the passive one and an active one. Uh, freezing is the passive method. I mean that uh, during the second war, the German uh, army uh, found this method for uh, underground tunneling in the clay soil and silty soil. Usually we use the freezing method for soil stabilization plus preventing and the water discharge into the underground area. Uh, freezing is very, very expensive method Theoretically, as Mortiza commented, is completely possible. But for the large area and with an open area in uh, uh, one part, it's really expensive. So usually with this part, uh, with this uh, similar job in the underground or mining, uh, we, we, we go to the active part and we dig some kind of well points or uh, different levels of the small well. And uh, we do the dewatering system by pumping or vacuum system. And in some crash zone, we do the uh, use the grouting. So usually in the underground the mining, uh, freezing method just for the gallery, we use the freezing to pass and also make the shot treat or the some kind of the segments or the concrete lining for a limited time, for a lifetime or for a, for example, some months we, we never used to go to the freezing. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. So is there any more question? And I want to add one comment. Uh, Mr. Afshari asked about the debuttering and also the shoring. Uh, when we have shoring, it means that we have the, uh, we are going to excavate very deep and the soil usually is not very good. Uh, and also if we have the water problem, uh, during the dewatering, we should very, very be careful about the land subsidence and settlements of the lifeline and also the neighborhood. I mean, the life lifeline, especially the sewer, the water, the gas line, usually we have them on the street. So when we do the dewatering, we should control, we should monitor completely and 24 seven days during the dewatering and excavation, the settlement of the old neighborhood. And if it happens, we should control, we should stop the dewatering because it will make some serious cracks uh, for the buildings, for the gas lines and all other lifelines. Usually if we have uh, some sensitive structures like the high rise, like the lifelines, like the highways, for example, uh, near the Young Street, assume that near the Young Street, we are doing the excavation. We do just very partial dewatering. We should use some, some kind of caissons or water tightening system, pile, concrete piles, edge piles, and to prevent coming, uh, to prevent and minimize the dewatering from during the showing. It's not an easy job to control the dewatering uh, volume and uh, discharge to control the settlements of the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Actually, the, the, the land is 70 by 300, uh, 250. But the problem that we have is the 70 by the 40. And yeah, yeah. The, both sides of the 40, there are two houses. Yeah. For example, yes. this number is 47. The, the, the wall of the 45, I don't have any problem. But the wall of the 49, I have a lot of problems. And we paid a lot of, uh, uh, they, they asked me actually to be the judge, how to figure it out and how to uh, do this system. So. I we couldn't get anything because only to prevent it by the uh, two by eight or probably some of these things four by four and put the two by eight at the behind it was too much uh, time consuming. This is why. But <clears throat> I wanted okay, to please know share the information with Mortiza, then we will be able to talk about in detail and if, how much, can we help you? Our pleasure. Thank you. Yes, much. I want to under I want to underscore what just Dr. Yasrevi said, it is very important for all of us to always remember. Dewatering 
has its limitations. Just taking the water out sometimes is not the solution because uh, Mr. Afshari, in the, in the case that we are introducing, for example, you do the shoring and you put a pump there and take the water out, but still your neighbor might suffer from settlement, uneven settlement or cracking the uh, driveway or, or whatever. So the bottom line is that even for a simple dewatering situation, the construction manager, the pro project manager should uh, consult with your technical engineer and professionals that know exactly where, when, how, how much, those are the big questions that should be answered. Thank you so much. So the today, today presentations. Uh, was... uh, uh, sorry, I, I have two questions. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I, I waited for everybody oh, to, please shoot. Please, please to shoot. go ahead. Uh, hopefully my, my questions will not need a lot of time. Uh, I want to ask Sean. Sean, uh, in your uh, second or third uh, slide, you showed uh, a picture about the location of Weeping Tile. It was inside the foundation. In a lot of projects, I've, I have seen that they put the Weeping Tile outside the uh, foundation. Which one do you recommend? What are the pros and cons of each system? Right. Uh, yes. Uh... Uh, commonly, uh, we put that outside and it's good uh, because wherever we put the pipe, the water level is going to be tangent to the, to, to the level of the water inside the, uh, inside the uh, pipe. Uh, it depends the level of the pipe and water, uh, uh, the level of the groundwater is going to uh, is going to be matched to that line. So if we put that inside, it's no good. It's no good. Uh, it doesn't mean uh, it's very bad. We don't do that unless we we have no place outside. Like is a usually uh, when uh, high rises. Like example of that is there are high rises. Like uh, they occupy the entire land and outside of the foundation wall, there's no room, or you have city property at, uh, that's right of it. You, you are not allowed to put these uh, weeping tiles outside. So then uh, there is no choice. You have to put that inside. Uh, if we do that, the, 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 the line of the groundwater won't cross the, um, the, the, um, the, um, the basement level. But the, the inside, but, but it still is going to cross the foundation, uh, which is tolerable. Still, uh, is no good, but that's the only choice. We cannot do uh, any better uh, because uh, if you remember, we, I said about the torpedo lines in uh, torpedo pipes. The torpedo pipes are not are not there to collect groundwater. They are there to collect the, what is it called? The moisture, just a little bit of water between the uh, shoring and- the seepage. Uh, seepage, seepage, yes, yes, that's the wording. <laughs> so, but yes, you are right. Uh, when we put that, there, when there is no choice, if we, when we cannot put the, wall, uh, the pipe, uh, the weeping pipe outside, right beside the foundation, mm -hmm. then, uh, since we are out of uh, option, we put that inside. Uh, it's not ideal, but it can do, it's better not to put anything. Yes, uh, I hope I could answer to your question. Okay, yes, thank you. Another question is about discharging the stormwater in small projects, in, uh, in regular houses in downtown Toronto, there is not much room in the backyard to distribute the water. Uh, sometimes we use a dry well that we dig a well and uh, fill it with uh, gravel or pebbles or uh, such material. And we let the, the circumference of the well 
be the be the medium to distribute the, the excessive water into ground. Uh, do you recommend that system or not? The dry well system. Uh, yes. Uh... You call that dry well? I Sometimes call it, they call it French drain or dry well, I don't know. Yeah, they're all the same. Uh, dry well, French drain is uh, above the ground, uh, but the infiltration gallery is the same concept, the same thing, uh, but it's underground and uh, it should be below the first step. And uh, yes, it's the same, but uh, you have to uh, evaluate the percolation rate of the ground, like if the ground has capacity to drain it out. Uh, and you have to be in certain distance from uh, the closest uh, uh, building the structure, uh, because you don't, you're, you're not going to take away uh, the, uh, your groundwater to your neighbor. Uh, so yes, uh, that's the solution. It's, it's strongly be recommended uh, by the city and everybody. But again, because of the limitation, it's uh, it's not uh, uh, usually it's not practical because it won't. <laughs> yes, it's ideal. It's it's the best. But if we can, uh, the li the limitation is this: five meters from each building. Uh, one meter above the bottom of this uh, from the, uh, infiltration gallery, or you call that the uh, dry well, uh, should be one meter above uh, uh, free um, uh, ground, uh, underground uh, groundwater level. And uh, the, the quality, the percolation rate of the ground, the dirt uh, should allow you to discharge your flow rate I, I, if I remember, uh, it should be discharged in 24 hours. Uh, so uh, we do some calculation to, to design this uh, infiltration gallery. But since restriction, like you, you said, uh, you said the downtown Toronto, I don't think there are big land. Uh, like usually they have problem of the area, the land the free land to design this. Yes, that's a problem. Always there is a problem for uh, for whipping time, but uh, there's no other. Uh, maybe uh, Shahab can add something to that. Yeah, from the geotechnical point of view, the whipping tile is very important when we have clay soils. And when we have the clay soils, it's better to put the whipping tile just in back of the wall over the footing to prevent the, high, uh, the rising of the level of the water. So as soon as, uh, 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 as much as we can, we should put the weeping tile just in the back of the uh, wall and also over the footing. And uh, if we don't have any option like the, for like, for example, underpinning cases for the old buildings and renovations, we should use the uh, weeping tile inside the uh, building. So generally from the geotechnical point of view, the best option is using the whipping tile outside and the back of the wall, because if you have the sandy soil as a base soil, they will, will never have the, um, the, the water level. But if we have the silty clay or clay soils, we should prevent the rising of the level, uh, the water level in the back of the water. And about the corrosion, I want to echo corrosion that uh, Mr. Jamal, if I ask a question. Uh, I want to add some point. Uh, maybe the oxygen is the most important uh, need for the corrosion happening. Maybe we have a, a stable water level. As a rule of thumb, we are not worried about the corrosion because at, after some months, even uh, not, less than one year, there will not be any oxygen for the, uh, the corrosion to happening in the corrosion. I, I had experience in the Urmia Lake. You know, the Urmia Lake is one of the worst uh, environmental condition. About 40 years ago, they put some pile in the soil to pass the bridge between the lake. Uh, all, uh, all of these pipes, but not galvanized, no epoxy, nothing. Just the pure uh, steel they, they put in the soil. Uh, about 50, 55 meter of uh, the, the piles that were in, inside the mud and inside the salty soil, nothing happened. Uh, there was not, not, the corrosion was absolutely zero. But in the splash zone, 
when we have the water go up and calm down, go up and calm down, we name it a splash zone. The corrosion was nearly 100%. You can even touch it by a crash your, by your hand, the piles. So for the corrosion, if we have the stable water and the, the high water level, we will not have a corrosion problem. But for the semi-saturated soils and the fluctuation part, we, we should really be worried about the corrosion. Even with pure water, the corrosion will happen. Uh, excuse me, I, add, I have to add something It's very important. This leaping time only works when your building is narrow. Like, uh, if if your, uh, uh, your building is uh, wide, like uh, in uh, uh, like high rises and in large luxurious houses, when the area of the building is, uh, is wide and then only installing weeping tile outside of the building won't work. It's, it's very important. And, and I had project, many projects, like actually some of my clients are luxurious houses. They're building, there is no fault. There is no fault in weeping tile. Weeping tile is working perfectly. But the only problem is when we put these weeping tiles in outside the perimeter of the building, there is an intention especially when we have a lot of water, water comes back. When the distance of these two weeping tiles are, uh, are, are, are big, and then the line of uh, foundation, uh, the line of groundwater is gonna come back. It's gonna come back, it's like a curve. And if the distance are big, and then this line cross the foundation, uh, the, the basement, the basement uh, slab, and even past that. Then we, we have the, like water is gonna come up. The solution for that is to put more, add more uh, dipping tiles under, uh, like between, under the slab to keep it inside. The water is gonna stay inside, not come out of, uh, basement slab. So keep in mind, it's very, very important. Almost if the building is big, the lar large building, especially with uh, close to a square, you must put uh, extra pipes like dipping tiles under the slab to keep water uh, not to come out. Otherwise, it's going to come out, no doubt on that. You mean both sides of footing? Dripping tile, both sides of footing? No, no, no. Practi In practically it should be like a star pattern. You know, you have some place that you put your sub pump and from that point would be the focal point. You have to have different lines going like stars to the mm -hmm. outreach of the building. So wherever the water comes, the system should uh, collect it. Inside, like a network, inside, like a yeah. network inside yeah. the building. Yeah, yeah. network, yeah, inside, inside. Yeah. I mean, uh, okay, a star is excellent, but uh, many people doesn't put any pipes even inside. Uh, yeah. You know, as a rule of thumb, uh, we should, uh, this, uh, the the uh, distance between each two parallel uh, uh, weeping tile should not be more than two to three times of the depths of the Weeping tile, assume that. If you have the 10 feet depth in weeping tile, both weeping tiles parallelly should not be more than 30 feet. As, a, as Sean mentioned, we have a luxury house, for example, the weeping tile, the width of the house is 50. If the water level is high, we should assume that some days, after some days, we will have some wetland in, the, in between of the, in the middle of the basement. So it's the best way to use some kind of the French drain as a gravel. Uh, in the network as a, a rectangular network and to connect all of the network to each other to be uh, completely sure that we will not have the water discharge from the bottom. If the water is serious, we should use some kind of lean concrete, some mat, like a mat foundation, not for the bearing capacity, just to prevent the water coming up and make it watertight. We had similar projects with more design, the Doncaster, uh, that uh, it was two-story underground, two-story uh, like for a sport gym, and we had a water problem, so we made it completely capsulate and watertight. But it's expensive for small houses. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. 
So, uh, Ross, do you have a question or comment? Oh, I have a, one comment. I just want to uh, just add up to Shahab's comments on uh, corrosion of uh, Reba. I have an experience with a lot of uh, rehab work, demolition, and all kind of uh, uh, hydroelectric generating stations and dams. Uh, when we demolished so many uh, old concrete, 80 years old uh, concrete, most of the uh, reba completely submerged under the water. They were, they were, we didn't find any kind of corrosion other than what Shah uh, mentioned along the splash zone. Uh, I believe Sean also showed uh, some kind of uh, water stops in between concrete so that uh, there would be no inflow of, uh, you know, seepage water or something like that into the building. I even saw many areas where they had a construction joint and they put just a simple timber, something like four by four along the waterway. And that's uh, the one we demolished was something like, uh, I don't know, again, another 78 years old. All those timber at construction joint to act as a water, uh, water stop because when timber gets soaked up, it expands and stops the water flow. It's an old idea. They were all uh, very good timber, except at the uh, top two, three feet, top two feet of a splash zone. So that's how good it is in most of the case, especially in fresh water, that uh, the water will not uh, deteriorate concrete unless, as uh, Shahab mentioned, oxygen's getting get into because of uh, uh, freeze and thaw or a splash of water. Just want to let you know. Yeah, that's, that is completely right. When there is no oxygen, there is no corrosion in a steel. But uh, in some area when we have the color, the color yon, uh, the coloride, uh, the chloride penetrated to the um, to the uh, to the concrete, and uh, it it make a, some chemical uh, uh, actions between the uh, the cement component and the chloride, and the result of this uh, this uh, action is the corrosion in the rebars. So. Sometimes you have some some bridges without any water in around it, but the corrosion happens in the in the in the rebars because of the chloride. Uh, fortunately, there is not very uh, severe condition of the uh, chloride here in Toronto, so we are not very. Uh, 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 we, 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 we didn't think about this, but somewhere in the coastal area, in, in the, 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 the side of the, uh, the beach side of the oceans, uh, mostly in the, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, big ocean uh, and some, some, some seasides. Uh, we have the color, uh, chloride in the in the in the in the atmosphere, so it could uh, make a corrosion uh, underwater somewhere that there is no water and so on. Mm, but uh, usually the corrosion of the steel is because of the oxidation, and it uh, we we need the the oxygen for that. Uh, so when we are under the ground or under the water and there is no oxygen, so there is no corrosion. But when the rebar is in the cement and the chlorine is there, the chloride is there, the action between the chloride and the cement will uh, cause some um, reactions in the rebars that uh, make a corrosion in there. So, uh, in this situation, we use the special kind of cement for, for prevent of the action of the chloride. For example, type two cement, Portland cement should be used in this area. Okay, thank you.
so if there is no more comment or questions, so let's finish the this meeting. It was really informative, really interesting topic. You know, we have Mr. Apostatagon with us. You know, I think <laughs> you wanted to leave us, but maybe yeah, the, no, I, I was able to say thank you, thank you for the presentation. Prefer to stay. But um, anyway, I, I really appreciate Sean and Morteza taking time, preparing a very uh, useful um, PowerPoint. And let's uh, have the closing notes or a speech uh, from Mr. Khodavande. Thank you all for participating in this uh, friendly uh, environment. We at uh, Association of Canadian uh, Iranian Engineers and Architects uh, strive for excellence in cultural and technical and scientific uh, areas. And uh, we have not only scientific gatherings like this one, we have a lot of uh, recreational and uh, celebration activities as well. Please uh, consult our website at www.mohandes.com and uh, we hope that uh, at some point you will decide to join us and become a member. Thank you all for participating. Have a very good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.